Grand Rising, I'm Ron Arusha, and welcome to Conversations on the Spiritual Journey. Today I'm speaking with Laurel Erica, poet, writer, wordsmith, creator of Word Magic Global. And I was looking at why you're saying this, it reveals the playfulness and the artistry in words. Well, the tagline I have is, um, how is it? It's about revealing the spells words have cast on our minds to make way for a higher frequency of communication and energy. Red and rising, Laurel. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Laurel, let's get straight into it. What are these spells that are in the English language in particular? Well, you find me and many others do through this, the video I posted in 2010 called The Secret Spells of the English Language. And so that's a simple sentence. I call it our premier life sentence, but actually there's one before it. In any case, this life sentence is we awake each morning and go off during the weekdays to earn our living at various jobs and undertakings until we come to the weekend. And everyone agrees that that's just kind of the way of life. Uh, however, more people die between 6 and 10 a.m. Monday morning of heart failure than any other time of the week. So I do a translation of the English language and I spell it T-R-A-N-C-E. I reveal the echoes in words. And so um, the translation of this sentence is that a wake is a, a funeral party for the dead. And you uh, attend a wake in mourning. That's the state you're in. So we say good morning to each other. We might as well just say good grief because that's what that's about. And so there, I, I suggest there is a subliminal influence that darkens the lens through which we peer out at reality or what we think is reality. Basically the lens being the words we use to describe it. So, because you can't see something very well if you can't describe it, you can't contemplate its possibility. So we awake each morning, awake is a funeral party for the dead, morning is the state you're in when you attend awake. You would have to be staggering around through life in a week days, like a somnambulist, a, a, a zombie. <laughs> Um, to earn the living because urns are for the ashes of the dead. We even call our jobs undertakings. Um, an undertaker is another word for an entrepreneur. We race to meet deadlines and job itself is a Hebrew word for persecuted. And what we get at the end of this perverse bargain with life is progressively weakened over time. So in America, uh, in the US, I should say, we pronounce the 10 year piece of time, uh, a decade, but you Brits say it like it is, a decade. And there is sort of a decaying of spirit in the sense that it is so dispiriting to be doing work that has nothing to do with who you are or why you came to the planet. So our most prevalent greeting to each other is hello. And when you reverse the syllables, you have oh hell. So I explain on that 2010 um, YouTube video, I explain in verse, which I'll, I'll just tell you in spontaneous speech, but I explain in verse why I think this occurs. And a lot of people, when they find my work, want to know who did this to us. And that's not been an area of my research. I imagine some was very intentionally done. I know that dictionaries shrink <laughs> and um, 
and get more simplistic in their definitions. They lose big, precious, gorgeous words that can help you uh, look at, understand what you're looking at if you had the word to name it. Um, and I'll share an example in a moment. But um, these amazing words get redefined or disappear entirely. So there is certainly purposeful manipulation of the word. And, and the very fact that we can be manipulated with sound bites just shows how degraded our um, discernment has become because we've been so glued to programming. We've been allowing ourselves to be programmed through the screens. And so people are becoming less and less thoughtful uh, less and less able to connect dots, um, more compliant. Um, and there's been, you know, everyone who was already self-reliant is challenged to stay that way at this point. So there's been a whole degradation that's gone on in the culture. And I think some of it is most definitely intentional from way back. But I also think that because words are echoing and resonating, they're like electromagnetic frequencies and they travel from ear to here, uh, here to there and ear to ear. And um, it's like a coin being passed and it has the imprint of so many people's consciousness on it. So when you learn English, um, as a child, especially, you get programmed into that set of lenses of looking out at the world and in, with a very, very dark view of it. So, um, let's see where to go from here. I guess I'll share with you, but except you probably want an interactive conversation and obviously I could just keep going. So you direct, please. No, please go ahead. Um, I was interested in the, you, we've got morning and then morning. So is there, yes. there's obviously a vibrational quality of difference between both of them. So if we are saying good morning, what level is that vibration going at? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know the how to measure that. Mm. But what I do know is that these very different concepts are sharing the same sound. So my sense is that by context, we know which morning we're talking about, but we're repeating this word over and over and over like an affirmation and mourning is about a state of grief and we get accustomed to feel so out of step with ourselves mostly doing work that is not about who we are or why we came here as i said um, and so i like to show what i have found in terms of interesting coincidences of words that do cohabit a resonance. It's like they share the same residence. And because when you put enough of them together, it's like creating a sonogram of cultural consciousness. And as we know, sonograms create images. So if you play with words, if you not only watch what you say, but you listen as well, I mean, words will inform you. They will, they will point something out to you that is like, oh, I mean, big aha moments. It's, it's just really quite remarkable. So that's what I like to show. And by showing what I call the secret spells, I I talk about words that hypnotize us to see the world in a certain way that is not self-affirming or life-affirming or planet-affirming. It's a quote, dog-eat-dog -dog world. That's not a, that's a phrase because there are these phrases too, like the, um, you know, performers say break a leg and I heard Greg Braden say, um, what was his? 
oh, I don't know, move a heart or something like that. And mine has been sprout a wing. So there's a lot of negative messages in our common phrases. And fray is a funny word, phrase. It's like to fray something is to kind of unravel the seam or something or the edge, lots of threads hanging down. So the language is always echoing and reflecting us back to ourself. And it, as I can tell, um, you, we either get echoes and reflections of cultural consciousness or of higher consciousness. The reason being that is, in my view, that words emerge at the convergence of consciousness and culture. So it's this electromagnetic sonic system. It's going to tell us about ourselves. So I wrote a whole book, it's unpublished, um, called We Do Come With Instructions. And it's the ABCs of self-realize, seeing out of our true eyes, not the hypnotized eyes, um, but, but developing the discernment and, and the eyes and the heart and the ears and the whole body connected to become awake to what's going on because the life's dream is the life's dream. We're in a dream, someone else has, um, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, and we have the capacity collectively to dream a new dream of reality with so much authenticity and beauty and kindness for all because the only way we're going to survive is if the English, if humankind evolves into human kindness because the earth and the heart are one word, which means, hello, we are mirrors of each other. You have hardened your heart to the earth <laughs> and she is dying. So <laughs> if you want to rejuvenate the ground of our being, start with kindness because the earth heart connection to me is about human kindness. And the lovely thing about kindness and altruism is that they've discovered it um, affects the same centers of the brain as cocaine. So I call kindness heart candy and that we feed ourselves with the sweetness we extend to others. I even have a whole word for it, a bookmark it, and I'll go back and explain it after you come join me in the dance. And so um, the word I invented for the most exquisite form of pleasure that you can have with, through intercourse with everyone you meet, even with masks on, where the intercourse is projecting loving kindness through your heart and validation through your eyes. So what that sets off in the body temple with practice in the neural circuitry is so blissful. I, well, and just to point out the word generosity has arrows right at the center of it. The word misery, just drop the why and you'll see why, because it's being a miser. So, with boundaries and discernment, loving kindness shared with others creates such a blissful condition that I decided to create a word to describe the extremity of it. And the word is ultra, no, no, that's a different word. It's, all right, it, the little word fairy flew off with the word. She'll come back, oh, meta. Transensuous, super 
se sexual parahedonism, meta transensuous suprasexual parahedonism. And that is all those words, meta and trans and para, it's all about above, above what we ordinarily know. And all the rest is about pleasure, sensual and sexual, because I do believe Freud was correct that we operate on the pleasure principle. He just got you know, stuck in the lower chakras and didn't know that the more we refine our body, our mind, our spirit, the higher and more refined the pleasures we experience. And so they're at a higher frequency. And so the word for that ultimate pleasure that I created for myself, and it is a pleasure we create for ourselves by going out in the world with the intention to recognize that every soul we encounter in whatever shape or color or age or whatever they come in, everyone is a precious design, <laughs> divine, download a soul visiting a form a human form only part of us incarnates from what i understand but it's a divine being as the saying goes having a human experience and i believe we all need to letter in humanity as they do in universities the letter would be e and that takes us from human to humane and with the intention to be humane and compassionate, to see people in as the God beings they are, we are. And just in that way, just even passing by without eye contact, um, with that intention, oh my gosh, um, it's like you get to be the smudge stick. <laughs> for a town or a city and the pleasure that that brings and the gifts from spirit is our exquisite. So that was my word for that. And um, you started and that's where I got with morning. The dark view of life that doesn't have to be. You have such a playful way with words. It's like you're creating and I Go back to what I learned a while ago was um, you're making spells, which is why we call it spelling. Yes. 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 So right. how do we get in touch with this, this use and delicious way that you use words? Let me take a sip of water, asking for inspiration. Well, I'm sure prior to finding my work, you, um, you saw disease written as dis-ease and history as his story. Can you think of any others? Uh, well, there is um, television, which is tell I yes. vision. Uh, uh -huh. TV programming. Yes. Uh, remote control being controlled. Um, That's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I think there's a lot to do with as well the, the boats. They call them seamen. And um, you know, that hasn't been my area of oh, research yes. at all. Okay. Um, yeah. Because that goes back to the question, uh, and, and thank you for those words, and to answer the question that you had asked before we got into that riff, the way you learn to play with words playfully is to play with words, and to know that even though there's maybe a, a few words, a few more these days, um, where people see that there's a double meaning in them that may be undermining us. Um, so even though it's only a handful that have been discovered, uh, it's all over the language. I I've, I've have more than a handful that I've been able to dig up and it's just so much fun. So um, it's entertaining. You don't have to be well educated for it you just have to open your ears 
and hear what's being said because we numb out. We're so stunned by all, everything that's happening right now. It's hard to stay conscious in it. And we go looking for where am I going to get relief in a hurry? And that's you know what addiction is about. There's so much stress because we're so out of touch with nature, which is the ground of our being and the only reality. Everything else is man-made, artificial, based on some, maybe some interesting or brilliant concepts, but not necessarily life-affirming. So go out in nature and play with words is my answer to that question. And there's actually, this I think you'll find very interesting. I'm doing a search since I'm uh, no, darn it. Well, maybe I'll remember it. So um, the Oxford English Dictionary was an enormous uh, undertaking that took um, decades and decades. And there is a beautiful um, little poem that relates to go out in the woods and look for words. Um, and the poem was written to the first editor of the Oxford English Dictionary. And since I'm not finding it in a hurry, I'll do my best to recall it. Oh, somewhere on Elysian fields where the light breath of Zephyr stirs the bosky groves and sylvan lanes reserved for lexicographers, where with your kind in stillness, no disturbance varies. You crouch on beds of asphodels, gently discussing dictionaries. So I, I didn't do that quite right. Um, I can send it to you if you want to post it and the author as well. And um, I found it so interesting once to learn that an anthology like a collection of poems or essays. An anthology originally was a collection of flowers. And as a little girl, I would uh, read Robert Louis Stevenson's book, A Child's Garden of Verses. So there's so much inherent poetry in nature. Everything is poetic. Trees talk. Um, all, everything does, there's awareness, everything is alive. And I was reading something very interesting today and uh, about how uh, nature-based people, their language unwritten was referent to nature and incorporated animal sounds. And this was, they were in the living lifescape where everything was alive and everything communicates. And I would say the same is true for words. They're these elemental entities, you know, each, each syllable is actually a single letter. Um, and and you, they'll tell you their secrets, I promise. You'll find all sorts of things in all sorts of ways. And this book about the language of the sensuous, I think it's called, and I'll, I'll get you that reference as well. But he was saying how they were living in a living matrix, human beings were, among non-human beings. And on, on multiple dimensions, they were aware of it and communicating with it. And um, we are now so uh, abstracted from nature, and the author was talking about the role that literacy at the alphabet took, you know, to so that we're no longer referring to the natural world. So, and he said that all these electronic gadgets on your refrigerator, on your, you know, on everything that talk to you, that it's like living in this recreated, animated atmosphere. So look at the word atmosphere itself. Do you hear anything in, interesting in that word? My promise. These are so obvious. <laughs> well, there's a fear in there. Um, yep. It's 
So I'll please. Yeah. Okay. So well, this is something interesting, and I find it in myself all the time, being oblivious to the obvious. And the difference between oblivious and obvious is li or lie. So it's like things are right before our eyes and we're not seeing them or right before our ears. I do this, I, I, I embarrass myself how often I do this, you know. Um, so, so becoming aware is just listening, looking and listening. And so what I hear in the word atmosphere is atmosphere. See, I mean, so this is another piece I was going to tell you about that. A year ago, a friend's friends visited and um, I was waiting in the car with the four year old boy who was on a little video game. And I kept hearing the voice in the game saying, nothing going on over here, let's look elsewhere. Nothing going on over here, let's look elsewhere. Which is programming of a four-year-old not to look at the obvious and recognize what it is. Because the insanity of what's going on is pretty obvious, but it's denied. And uh, people are terrorized this way. So it's not herd immunity they really are eager for, but her herd mentality, a flock of sheep. So there is this great impulse toward unity consciousness. We all feel it who are in the community of awakening hearts, minds, and souls, and bodies, we who know that there's so much more within us than we're expressing at this time, and we're seeking to get out of our own way and cultivate our superhuman capacities. The other, but everything is duality. So this, this probably cosmic, unifying principle that we're responding to the the people who have been in charge which means they get the biggest bang out of it i guess um, they're trying to create unity consciousness modeling it after ants so at a time when we are meant to come together and become a super organism where the genius of the multitudes and each one is born a genius unless you're somehow damaged um, or genetically impaired for whatever particular reason you chose to journey through this realm at this time in that form other than that everyone is a genius and it just you know gets i think it was bucky fuller said that everyone's born a genius only um you know, education system degeniuses them. So just the awakening <laughs> to words, because words are how we're, you know, words are how hypnotists, propagandists, merchandisers cast spells. We're doing it too, because the language needs re retuning and refining. It's, it's a powerful, powerful energy. I, I read somewhere, I can't remember his name, that the second coming is the language itself. Awakening to the power we have as speakers and writers of the word. And how, when we are of noble character, and can you hear the hidden message in noble? You'll attune, it's a process. And I don't mean to embarrass you because it, 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 until you tune up, you don't know really what you're listening for, but you're listening for the obvious. To be noble, someone can't confer nobility upon you. You cannot buy nobility. You may hold a rank and a title and some people may, you know, 
bow to you in your face and uh, who knows what, <laughs> curse you behind your back. You have nothing. So noble is self-defining. It's noble. You have to be a person of integrity who is as good as your word. And I am on my way in that direction. So I do not claim to have scaled the mountaintop. However, I know the direction to go, which is if it comes out of my mouth, make sure it honors my being, that it honors the other being, and that whatever intention I've set in motion, I follow through or apologize and um, redesign how I will accomplish whatever I had promised. So are we in like a word matrix? Yes. Where we've been programmed and our minds have been limited by the actual words that have been used. And if our vocabulary is getting smaller, that would mean our range of thinking as well would be getting narrower and narrower. Yes. What a perfect segue. Remember I bookmarked, oh, well, two words. So one of the words that hardly anyone knows is a word to describe people who hold an adamant political position and they might be very loud and very insistent and ready to march and, and storm and do whatever, but they're mainly ignorant or their source of information has been um, compromised. We don't know really anymore who is speaking the truth, what's really going on. We have some trusted informants. Um, in any case, it is a matrix made out of words, it appears that we are affirming and adding energy to as we speak. So if we intentionally choose to speak beauty, and I'm not perfect here, but if our intention is always that what comes out of our mouth, may it be powerful or full of, uh, of anger, that there's integrity, there's no bull. It's not an ego competition with somebody else. And the intention is to, to speak truth with power and beauty. That's my intention. So yes, it is like a matrix made out of words. And to what degree, I do not know. But the main issue for me has been not who did this to us, but what do we do about it? But however, <laughs> the, the blinding, <laughs> the spell casting happened, we still exceed <laughs> Um, by billions, those who are trying to turn us into an ant colony, uh, uh, patrolled by drones, perfect word, isn't it? At the command of a AI queen, no doubt. So just uh, using humans as a, a labor force and whatever else, it's just, but here we are at this moment where there's all this amazing, powerful, divine energy coming in. And there's also all of this chaos. We're being unified in chaos. And I just saw something with the hand motions I was doing, kind of like an arc from heaven meeting right in front of my face. And then the arc that connects the earth, it was forming an X. And X, in my view, <laughs> marks the spot, as it said, that point where it's like heaven meets earth at that point. And it's like a decimal point. But it's also um, the eye. It's the point of eye. This is like the infinite is pouring itself into the finite. And that nexus of heaven on earth is 
existence. And the word existence is X is tense. It's a tight squeeze. However, we have all of this energy that's creating urgency on both sides. The one that wants total control and the one that is seeking global ascension. And so we outnumber them. We, can, we cannot be censored for words of loving kindness. And let me just back up. Someone who loudly proclaims an opinion that is not based on, on, on true facts, real information, uh, they're called, ultra, the word is ultra crepidarian. And I just think it's such a fun, funny word. It means someone, it, something like uh, the Greek, stepping beyond your own sandals. You're talking um, about things you're not fully informed about. And so that makes you ultra crepidarian. So anyway, I'll, I'll, there's, so what do we do about it? We wake up. And we wake up to start listening, listening to words, the choice of words people are using. And how much beauty is there relative and love relative to anger and hatred. And you may find you're the only one who wants to create beauty instead of misery. So become that because it's, oh, I have a phrase in one of my poems that says, if our words so melt the heart, they start the milk of human kindness flowing so that every time we speak our mind, we set another flower growing. Then I believe before our very eyes, we human beings like butterflies will fully metamorphosize. So butterflies are like flying X's. We're, we're right at that spot. There's all this energy trying to pull us down and all this energy trying to pull us up. And it's a, a choice sometimes moment by moment and sometimes uh, doesn't take, you know, it just flows naturally because you're, <laughs> you're using the compass in your heart and that compass is compassion. It's compass I-O-N. That's, and with <laughs> ongoing compassion, word by word, whatever, yeah. It's like what you're saying, you know, when we see the duality, so, words and i read this somewhere if used to harm can become swords mm -hmm. and to pay attention and to look at the words that we're using can just um create a great change around the people that we're with and within us as well yes absolutely true and thank you for bringing that up yeah, I've seen people spin in a circle <laughs> when I've shared a word, and I'll, I'll tell you which word that was um, in just a moment. Okay. Let me get centered again. Oh, it was word and sword. Um, Look at the word laughter and do something interesting with the S. Uh, slaughter, isn't it? You bring it to the front, yes. Yeah. Yes. Now take the word comic and do something with an S. We should leave it as a puzzle for your listeners. Okay. That's everything I share is obvious. Yes. Except for some of these old words. Mm -hmm. um, just take it after C-O, 
then put that S, which was on Superman's shirt, remember? And his cape, C-O-S-M-I-C. The comic has become cosmic. And we are living, I have a piece called Putting the Source Before Descartes. Um, it's in my book. I have a book called Word Magic Wordplay that puts a new spin on the world. And it's a collection of my verses. And there's a CD in the back. So, um, I have, so in putting the source before Descartes, it, it says, you know, it's good, some good lines. There's only circumstantial evidence for reality. Physicists doubt it exists in actuality, which means that matter, though it's seen, can disappear as in a dream because it ultimately lacks all actuality. But what I was going to share, that's in the putting the source before Descartes, but here is, you, you know Descartes' formulation, I think, therefore I am. So in this poem, I have edited it. And it goes, God is, therefore I am. I am, therefore I think. I think, therefore I doubt. I therefore doubt I am. So the point is we've been hypnotized. We're in a word matrix. The words are our, are our lenses on the world. And we have we're sleepwalking so as i said the life stream is you know the stream that is that carries life and the dream that is our life and they we they gave the secret away when we first arrived on earth and they said um row 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 your boat gently down the stream merrily 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 life is but a dream and that is does appear to be what it is. And since we, well, you know what? I could share speaking beauty with you. And and that will be a more eloquent version of what I was going to say. <clears throat> we are godlings on this planet here because we all pre-planned it. Ghastly, ghostly shadows, damn it. Now's our chance to superman it. Lift your voices, re-enchant it. Re-enchant it, freedom's codes are all semantic. Though we're small and sometimes frantic, souls are whole and all gigantic. These may be our darkest hours, yet each of us has superpowers. The infinite is infinite, which means we can turn on the light. So sages, sorceresses, mages, artists of all types and ages, share your gifts now, be courageous. Daring actions are contagious. A diamond mind and heart of gold are truths, the prophecies foretold for those aligning souls on earth by honoring each being's full worth. When we let go of againstness, we step into our immenseness for the genesis of genius is the light we strike between us when we share the gifts with which we're blessed to inspire higher consciousness. Then we'll gain what we've been dreaming of, the gift of everlasting love. The kiss of everlasting love, the bliss of everlasting love.
when you speak those poems and we start really listening to the words, it seems like something just stops and slows down and allows you to just look. And um, so you kind of move out of the time of the speed of what you normally go at. So I think just from that aspect, you start seeing the words with the way you use them as well. It's the playful energy to them. It's a, uh, and I think we probably had that at the very beginning when we were children and we were learning to speak. We love to use words. Uh, our first word was really important but somehow they got crushed out of us by living in this world and in society. Yes, except there's a lot of admiration. I mean, as little children rhyme, that's like playing with magnets, mm -hmm. verbal magnets. And when you see what sticks together, you can you know, open up a whole story in your head. So rappers do that. They're, I, I, I think of them as nimble verbal gymnasts that they can do remarkable things with words. However, sometimes the content is not worthy of the vehicle. So the vehicle being both the, the talent who created it and, and who speaks it and the, and the work, the rap lyrics themselves. It's Back to that word, metatranscensuous, suprasexual parahedonism. If you would like to have exquisite pleasure, then communicate in ways that uplift and hold that intention to do so. And I believe I've lost a little thread here. So back to you. So is it first the vibration as well of these words? First is the vibration, the words come from that. And um, if we look at, oh, another one I remembered. Um, so the universe, one song. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So yeah, so is it that um, if we are become awareness, we are aware of the vibration of the word and us speaking it, then it has a higher resonance. Yes, yes. And and depending, I mean, the same word can be spoken um, kindly or harshly. Um, and did you ever see the photographs um, called Mess a book of photos, messages from water? Uh, put. You did see that, so and and probably your audience will have where even um, words in various languages scotch taped to a bottle of pre-tested distilled water. Um, the it's like the water read the words and created a mirror of them in crystalline form. So. Um, ugly, mean words got really distorted shapes from the water as the mirror. And I think in that film, um, is it, I can't remember what the film's called now. It said that we are, was it 90% water? So right. what, are, what are we doing to ourselves if we say negative things to ourselves? Exactly. And, and to each other. Mm. It's like, and yet <laughs> we share one, you know, we share one uh, planet, our mother earth, and words that, words that sprout uh, positive feelings and thoughts in someone else's mind, those are the words that will bring us more pleasure when the energy returns to us because of a positive impact on someone else. Is it also then to be weary then of the words of the thoughts we're saying to ourselves, which can have such a negative impact, oh, yes. self, the yes. self-talk yes. of putting ourselves down, yeah. comparison and judgment, yes. which I guess we're trained to do in this, this as you said, dog-eat-dog -dog system of a world. 
well, that's sort of the image of it. And that's what we've lived. And yes. And recently I, I happened, I want to have a pen nearby so I don't forget any part of your question. Oh, there's a fun word I haven't thought of for a while, expatiate, which is kind of like, I guess, in my mind, free form jazz improvisation conversationally, that kind of thing, which is sort of what we're doing. So um, would you repeat your question, please? Um, what was that? I was just saying, um, how can we, um, what did I say? Um, well, let's let whatever new wants to come yes. up, come up. Okay, um, so um, let's just go, I also like what you said before, and I didn't go into it, was the, um, so there is this kind of global awakening of, of consciousness, but it's, they're trying to harness it in a different way, the controllers of whoever they are. So it's happening and there's nothing they can do about it, but they're trying to mold it in a way which suits the system. Well, they, they're not, they have more, a whole lot more than nothing they can do about it. But I think what it reminds me of, and you've heard this analogy before, is that when a caterpillar spins the cocoon and tightly wrapped and it starts dissolving. And these, the first cells of the new being are called imaginal cells and the caterpillar's immune system um, tries to destroy them because it, uh, it knows it will be the end <laughs> of the negativity or no, not of the negativity. It will be the end of the limited identity. So, but then there are so many and the awakening spreads as an energy through us and we prepare ourselves to be receptive to it and available through, as you were saying, being kinder in the words we use and think about ourselves or the habits we have. Um, there's so many different ways. There's actually, um, I'll tell you about it. You can post it, a, a, a EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique Free Symposium beginning soon. And I'll, I'll send you a link so and you can share it. So there's ways to get the uh, neural <laughs> pathways, you know, to create new neural pathways so that um, we're not constantly going down in the same thought spiral, ending up with a negative verdict on ourselves. So yes, becoming more awake and aware to words, to how they sound, to how they feel, because as as we were talking, we're predominantly water and just even a little written word with another language that has ugliness or cruelty in its intent can be, um, dis create distortions, can affect us adversely is the best way to say, because I don't know to what degree, but I do know that we are what, 8 billion? Is that the number now? Can you imagine if everyone chose to, um, it's sort of, it's like Christmas Eve in my mind, this visual I have of the anticipation of great gifts coming. And I think that's a legitimate anticipation now. Awakening is becoming ever faster and um, spreading far and wide. And so being, because it's not just the Genesis myth that says in the beginning there was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So, and we are said to be made in the image and likeness. And it isn't just um, Judeo, you know, Christian uh, faith that rely has the Bible with that Genesis story. That Genesis story is in many cultures, East and West, um, and industrialized and nature-based. We're potent and powerful as we speak and write and as we think. Um, not a good idea to go get 
well, there's there's all sorts of things to do to, to help quiet the mind. So, but when the mind is quiet, then the heart opens naturally. And the beauty that we were as children, as small children, so full of love and positive expectations and anticipation of new wonders to be discovered and new delights and, and had the ability to look at a situation like a, like a three or four year old and make profound insightful comments because the child is seeing with fresh perception and not with the sort of coded vision that we have at this point. Um, so, yeah. So by um, being this way, we are kind of, um, is it unraveling the code? And from there, I guess, a new perspective, a way of seeing things automatically occurs without anything having to be done. So perfectly said. I'd like to see that in writing if you get a chance. That is just a dynamite summation. It's the whole deal. And awareness is what helps us become more aware and of, of words. And you will find such treasures. I, so here's, here's a story I occasionally share about one of the favorite words I discovered. And again, it's looking at the obvious. Some people kind of manipulate the word, like, I, anyway, I don't do that. I just look at what's right in front of us. So I was out for a walk in nature, uh, overlooking the sea. And I love the pun in sea because we're looking to expand the scope of our ocean of consciousness. I was walking along and I said to my invisible friends, give me a new word. And they instantly gave me what, what beautiful is all about. And I, I won't, you can guess if you like, or I'll just go forward. It's again, it's so obvious and we um, end up. Well, beautiful. Yeah. Well, I read it on your one, uh, be okay. you to the fullest, yes. Yes, be you to full. Yes. No one can be the shining diamond of being that you are. And I have, and low self-esteem, I, I know it well, and, but it's based on a misperception. We took other people's reflections of us to heart and we thought they were true mirrors instead of those distorted carnival mirrors. So we've been, a lot of us, walking around with an, an assumed identity, assuming we're much less than who we are. So to be yourself authentically, to be you to full, no one can outshine you because A, it's not a competition, but B, no one can do you like you do you. And every piece of the puzzle is necessary for the whole picture to come together of a new world we're creating that works for everyone. And we can only do it if each person decides to be you to fall. And sometimes, when my esteem has been particularly low, I've thought about little tiny grass flowers, you know, smaller than a fingernail. And, and they're so ornate in their design. And I think if the creator lavishes this much focus and love and beauty on this tiny little flower that will be crushed under someone's foot, I think how much more was invested in me. So I don't think any of us ever finish opening the gift we are in this lifetime because there are wonders in every single one of us. And no matter how well or poorly educated you are, 
we all have divine Wi-Fi. And I have a little poem that says, we've a cellular line to the divine, but ego causes static. As we each let go and enjoy the flow, our lives become ecstatic. So yeah, just be you to fall, speak beauty when and wherever you can, starting most especially with yourself. Keep your eyes and ears open because there's a whole other level in which the English language is communicating with us all the time. And oh, I was going to tell you the word. And then, then the, maybe we'll end on this. The word that spun someone around, like a single word, can do it. And you see, oh my God, this wisdom right in front of us. And I, I have a poem about country names and the puns within them. It's really, I, I have some of it online. I'll send you the link. But in any case, I had to take out parts from the history that was current when I wrote it. And so the part... So the stanza that caused a, a friend to spin, um, I said, South Africans were very straight to call their system apart hate. But now thanks to Buddha, God or Allah, healing began with Nelson's mandala. And so, and it did, it wasn't carried further, unfortunately. We are human until we metamorphosize and become uh, a descended master. <laughs> Some, because awakenings are happening at increasing rates without all sorts of auster austerities and everything else, so. Thoreau, one last thing. Is the word drawn to the person or the person draws the word and the <laughs> feeling to them? Well, there's a, a Zen koan. <laughs> and um, well, so in <coughs> one, <laughs> it's just sort of like these thought flies. Oh my God, you know, if you're feeling really low, we attract negative energies, entities, even maybe negative verbal entities. And um, when, and the same thing happens when we're radiating. And I think it works both ways. It's not an either or, it's reciprocity. Thank you very much, Laurel, Erica. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. I've learned so much. And just so thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you. It was a, a beautiful pleasure because I felt the noble metal of your mind and your heart. And I just felt an immediate attraction and appreciation. So thank you. I'll be um, posting links to Laurel in the, in the, when I post it. So thank you very much. This has been um, Conversations on the Spiritual Journey with Laurel, Erica and Ranusha. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>